Well, let's get into God's Word this morning. We're going to continue to dwell on the theme of Easter and things that happened right after Easter as well. So that's what we're going to be headed towards here this morning. Surprise parties are always uh, a lot of fun to be part of, you know. If you've ever been part of a surprise party, you would, you would witness that there's a very palatable excitement in the air because everyone's running around in hushed tones, and especially when the actual surprise event takes place, you know, everyone kind of <clears throat> turning the light off, hiding, waiting for the person who the surprise is for to walk in, and on the moment they walk in through the door, everyone jumps up, you know, screams surprise, you know, and, and the people for whom surprise parties are planned, uh, the response varies, you know. You have some people who walk into a surprise party, and when they hear the word surprise being screamed, they literally pass out in excitement, you know. You have to revive them up again and tell them it's okay. We didn't mean to, you know, scare you to death. And you'd have other people who walk into a surprise party, and, you know, when you yell surprise to them, they literally have tears of joy, you know. They're just weeping, and others can scream, you know, in, in excitement for what everyone has done. Um, in, in, in celebrating with them as well. But I think one of the most annoying responses to a surprise party is when you have the person saying, I knew something was going to happen. I knew this was all being set up. I, I knew when I walked in here there was going to be a surprise party that was, you know, planned for me. And I think when it came to the disciples, they were in that group. They kind of knew what was about to happen because Jesus again and again, told the disciples when he was teaching them, saying, guys, I'm going to die soon. And I'm not just going to die, but I'm going to rise up from the dead. Even though the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ came probably as a surprise to many people. You know, they were like, what, Jesus is alive now? But for the disciples, it was not supposed to be that way. Jesus had given them the inside scoop, you know, for what was about to happen. Jesus had told them, you know, after three days, the Son of Man will be raised up again. And, and Jesus sometimes broke it down in simple, plain language in helping them to understand that Jesus would rise up again. And yet, when you read some of the incidences that happened after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're kind of surprised with the way the disciples behave. You're kind of surprised with the way they carry themselves even after seeing Jesus alive with their very own eyes. You could say that they knew everything, they saw everything, experienced incredible things, and yet they struggled with their faith. They struggled with their faith or coming to terms with what they had witnessed and what they had seen as well. And I think most of us seated in this room can relate to moments in our walk with Jesus Christ where we go through what you call a crisis of faith, where you've experienced God's guidance in your life. You know God loves you. You know that God has answered your prayers in the past. And you know that God works all things for good in your life. And yet there are moments in your crisis of faith or when you go through a certain circumstance or a certain situation that your faith really gets displaced, startled. And that's pretty much what was happening in the lives of these disciples. You know, they had seen the miraculous, they'd experienced it. And yet, even though they saw Jesus Christ rise from the dead, risen, they still struggled with coming to terms with that as well. Some of us, we go through those moments, you know, in our walk with Jesus, you feel like your prayers are hitting a brick wall, you know. When you're praying, it's like there's nothing that seems to be happening with your prayers. You know, your friend or, or your, your brother or your sister, <clears throat> their prayer seems to be, you know, producing results. When they pray for, even before they finish praying, the answer comes to them. And here you are, you're, you prayed, you fasted, you've interceded, you've done all the things that need to be done, and yet you find yourself in the same place. Nothing's changing. Nothing's breaking through. Nothing's happening for the things that you're believing for, things that you're hoping for. What do you do in those moments? You know, how do you reconcile your faith? How do you stand firm in those moments upon the promises that God has given you, you know? 
and the disciples, they, they were going through those kind of moments as well. And I, and I love the Word of God because the Bible is so honest in how it, it records incidences. It doesn't, you know, kind of smoothen over things and kind of, you know, make it all seem good. No, it tells us the nitty gritty of what happened, you know, because if you think about it, these were men who walked with Jesus for three years and had very close fellowship with Jesus, had literally seen Jesus rise, I mean, raise Lazarus from the dead and more as well. And yet they come to a point where they're ready to give everything up. You know, when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, all the Gospels make a record of the events that happened after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Matthew and Mark um, record quite uh, a, a short uh, bit of what happened. You know, there was more of a footnote of what happened. But when you read Luke and John, there's a little bit more record of some, some of the incidences that took place, some of the different scenarios that happened in those 40 days when Jesus walked on earth in his resurrected body as well. And we're going to focus our attention on this one scenario where these faithful disciples of Jesus who had walked with Jesus, ate with Jesus, you know, had lived life for three years and had the front row seat to all of God's miraculous, have a crisis in their faith, you know, and they're able, they're not able to reconcile what is happening. And the Bible gives a mention of it for us to also find encouragement as well from that incident. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the Gospel of John, Gospel of John 21. We're going to read the first 14 verses of John chapter 21, familiar passage. Some of us have dwelt on this several times, especially after Easter season. I think it's always kind of the appropriate season to look into the scripture passage as well. So this is what the Bible says. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, don't. Let's follow Jesus Christ and let's keep on being disciples of Jesus. No, they did not say that. They said, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. That night, they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. It happened so many times to these guys, you know, where Jesus stood somewhere and they did not know it was Jesus. Even after the resurrection, same thing. Verse 5, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although they were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Can we say amen to God's word? Amen. John, who writes this gospel, makes mention of the names of the disciples who decided to go back. He says there were seven disciples who wanted to get back to fishing, you know. I don't know why, but he only gives the name of five of them, but still mentions there are seven. And in the names that he did give, he withholds his name. 
He doesn't say his name was one of the guys who was the seven, but still, as you read the story later on, you kind of find out, oh, wait a minute, John, you, the beloved, were also in the boat with Peter, but you just failed to mention it in the list of names that you gave as well. But as you know, when John, you know, writes the epistle, the first name he mentions is Peter. He says, the first guy <laughs> to go back to fishing was Peter. Now, we all know Peter had a bad track record when it came to following Jesus Christ, you know. And it could be that that was what led him to that moment where there was a crisis of faith. You know, when Jesus said to Peter, Peter, you will deny me, you know, three times before the rooster crows. And that's exactly what Peter did. The Bible says at one point in Matthew chapter 22, you know, 54 to 62, when you read it, when Peter, you know, denies Jesus one of the times, he began to call down curses on himself and he swore to them, meaning he literally lost it. Like Peter at that point in time was his breaking point when the third person asked him, aren't you with Jesus? Peter reverted back to the fisherman language, which he was very familiar with and started to curse people around. Like he went so far back to his old persona of who he was and he just couldn't find himself to ever be back again with Jesus. And I think that's what he was dealing with, you know, especially, you know, when he had denied Jesus and the Bible makes record at the third time, and this is the middle of the night. The rooster doesn't crow in the middle of the night. You know, that's what the Bible says in Luke chapter 22, verse 62, uh, 61 and 62. And it says, the Lord turned and looked at Peter just as it was midnight, third time. He's, he's, he's denying the Lord and the rooster crows. And it was in that moment, Jesus looks at Peter because he was in the same courtyard probably. And Peter, the Bible says in verse 62, left that place and wept bitterly. Like he was a man with some deep shame. He did not want to see Jesus again. So the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead only made matters worse for, for Peter. You know, he had hoped he would never have to see Jesus again after he did what he did. And here was Jesus, you know, standing before him and Peter had not able to reconcile with what he had done to Jesus. And I wonder, you know, was that the reason why Peter, even though Jesus was alive, even though he had seen Jesus, decided, you know, for himself, he says, I'm not good enough to be a disciple for Christ. I'm not good enough to follow Jesus. I'm not good enough to be called one of the disciples. I'm going back to my old life. I'm going back to my former life, you know. Another name that John mentions is, is Thomas, you know. Thomas, nickname, Doubting, Doubting Thomas, you know, it was kind of a pessimistic guy. You know, he was always the guy who always saw everything as half empty, you know, like everything that people did or when he was there, when Jesus fed the, you know, the thousands of people, the multitudes, he was probably the one who says, it's not going to be enough, guys. It's not going to be enough, guys. It's not going to be enough, guys. You know, and yet Jesus did miracles. You know, even when one point, you know, John chapter 11, verse 16, you know, there's one record where, you know, Jesus had so much opposition against his ministry and people were talking with such strong words of violence that Thomas says to all the other disciples because Jesus was intent on going back. He says, all right, guys, come on, let's also go with Jesus and so that we may all die with Jesus. And this is where his mind was all the time. You know, oh, I'm going to die. I'm, everything's going to end badly. You know, and there was, again, the same scenario repeated after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Somehow, conveniently, Thomas missed the first appearance of Jesus. Again, Jesus comes personally to Thomas, you know, and says to him, hey, Feel, feel my hands and put your hand, put your finger in through my, through my palm so you can know for sure that it's me. It's Jesus standing before me. It's Thomas, again, dealing with his, his past, reconciling with, you know, his ability to not believe as well. I think Nathaniel was similar as well to Thomas because Nathaniel was also the guy, you know, with the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, when Jesus was calling the disciples, Nathaniel said, can anything ever any, anything good ever come out of Bethlehem, or Nazareth? You know, he was always, again, pessimistic in how he looked. And then John mentions that there were two other guys who were called the sons of Zebedee. You know, the sons of Zebedee had a nickname. They were called the sons of thunder. You know, that's what they were called. Meaning these guys were the loudmouth disciples, you know. They're always the ones, you know, they're the ones who told Jesus, Jesus, these guys are not listening to you. Just call down 
fire from heaven, burn everyone down. You know, these were the same guys who came to Jesus and also said to Jesus, you know, or had their mommy come to Jesus and said, mommy, please talk to Jesus on our behalf. We need to be sitting on his right hand when Jesus gets back to the throne. Mommy says, please, Jesus, you know, can you have these boys sit next to you? And Jesus says, it's not for me to give it to you. And he says, would you drink the cup, you know, that I'm about to drink? Yes, Jesus, we will drink the cup that you're about to drink. And when Jesus was crucified on the cross, where were the sons of Zebedee? Nowhere. We don't know where they were because they were far away hiding somewhere. And it's when you put together all a group of these disciples and you kind of look into the backstory of each disciple, you kind of understand that all of them had a common problem, a guilt about their past. You know, they all had things that they were ashamed of. And here was Jesus resurrected again from the dead. And they're not able to let go of their past, the things that they were ashamed of. And it was so great for some of them that they were willing to go back to their old life again. And something that the devil does often, you know, he holds our past as a ransom over us. You know, he reminds us of how horrible we were or what we have done in our past and how we are so undeserving of of anything that Jesus offers as well to our lives. And I think this is what these seven disciples were going through. They felt like we don't deserve to be part of this incredible movement that Jesus is starting after his resurrection. You know, we've failed him. I've, I, you know, I've, I've literally betrayed him. I've, I've given, I've, I've told people I don't know who Jesus is. You know, and it's, it was in those moments that these guys are, are ready to go back to their old life as well. Now, I love what Reynard Bonke, the renowned evangelist who's now gone to be with the Lord, he used to preach this all the time. He used to say, you know, when the devil reminds you of your past, you just need to remind him of his future. Then he'll be quiet, he said. And that's something a child of God always needs to do. Our past has been forgiven through Jesus Christ. When we ask for forgiveness, Jesus fully forgives our past. And yet, the devil uses our past to compromise the things that God wants to do in our life. One more thing that the devil does is he uses disappointments in our life to question our faith. Disappointments. So when we go through, especially if you're a child of God who's gone through a season in your life where your prayers did not have answers, where you find yourself, like I said, you know, hitting a brick wall, in your time of prayer, in your time of prevailing with God. And when you have this sense of disappointment rise up in you, the devil uses that to destroy our faith many times. There are many people who walk away from their, their journey of following Christ because the devil used a setback, a disappointment that happened in their life and blew it out of proportion to the point that they lose their faith. Maybe you're you know, going through something like that this morning where you're experiencing some sort of loss or a heartache or a disappointment in things not working out. You prayed and you fasted. You said, you know, Pastor, I've applied everything I've heard. I've applied all the teachings I've, I've read in the Bible and things are not changing. You know, is Jesus really real? Is, is he really going to help me? Is he going to change my life? Is he going to change the, the business that I'm doing and bless it? You find yourself in that moment of frustration, in that moment where things are not working out. And it's in those moments that the devil comes in and baits us and says, well, it's good to throw in the towel. Now, it's what he did with the disciples. It was in that moment where all of them were dealing with their own disappointments, the disappointments of not being good enough, disappointment of, of not following Jesus fully. It was, they were dealing with their own disappointment. And what does the devil do? Baits Peter and says, Peter, you're better off going back fishing. You're better off just doing what you were doing before you met Jesus. What's the use? You were with Jesus for three years. You heard his teachings. You saw his miracles. And here you are. You're just the same old fisherman. You're, you're not changed in any way. You're still cussing. You're still cursing people the same way you did when you were a fisherman. And how is it that Jesus has changed your life? And Peter, a disciple of Jesus Christ, who had the front row seat, does what? He walks away from the call that God had for his life. 
Então, that's why the Bible is such a great example for us to learn from. This passage especially for any of you who've gone through these moments I'm describing who can relate to what I'm saying in the crisis of your faith where you feel like nothing is working out in my walk with Jesus Christ. Is it really worth it? It's, would anything happen in my life the things I'm praying for and believing for? You got to pay attention to what happens in this passage. Peter is such a loud mouth. If he was to make a decision, he could have just said it to himself, whispered it to himself and said, oh, I'm going to go fishing. Okay. And just disappeared from the group. No. What does he do? He stands up in front of all of them and says, I'm going fishing. And all these other people who are already weak, who are already struggling with their own crisis of faith, as soon as they hear a way out of their misery, what do they do? We're going with you, Peter. We're all with you, Peter. Let's all go and die or let's all go do, do what we did. So all of these six other guys join Peter and, and the Bible says, and immediately they got into the boat. And if you read that passage, it says, and immediately they got, makes me wonder, were they already by the seashore already there? You know, already contemplating, I'm going to get back, I'm going to get back. And Peter says, I'm getting in. Everyone jumps in. You know, they get, they get into the boat. All right. Lesson for us to observe. When they get into the boat, all night long, they catch nothing. Anytime you walk away from what God has for you, you're going to have more disappointments. And that's what the devil does. He t entices us saying, oh, you're disappointed here. Let's try this thing. You might get it better. And that's what they thought. Oh, I'm going to go back to what I do good, what I do best. And sometimes when you walk out of the will of God, the purpose of God in your life, even the things that you have the skill for will be met with disaster. These seasoned fishermen, when they jumped back into the boat, all night long they toiled and they did not have anything to prove for their toil. Disappointments. When you step out of the purpose of God, when you step out of the call of God, you're not going to find satisfaction and fulfillment. You'll find frustration and emptiness. Now, the question that I want to put before us all this morning is, now when you read that passage, the Bible gives us the background story. This is what happened. You know, Jesus appeared to the guys, but then Peter stood up, said, I'm going fishing. All seven of them go immediately to get into the boat. They're fishing all night. And then there's a turn in the story. There's a guy who comes on shore calls out to them, guys, have you caught anything? My question is, what does Jesus do when we mess up? How does Jesus respond when we have these failure of faith moments? Now, that's what we learned from John 21. The way Jesus responds to his disciples who had been with him for those three years and walked planet earth and saw everything. How does Jesus respond to these deserters, to these men who literally gave up everything, even though Jesus went out of his way to call each of them by name, prayed all night to choose them to be his disciples. And when they walked away from the calling, how does Jesus respond to them? Jesus begins by asking this question, friends, have you caught any fish? All right, friends, have you caught any fish? Come on, turn to your neighbor and ask them, have you caught any fish? What do they say? No, they did not. When God asks us a question, it's not because he does not know the answer. All right? In all the Bible, every single time, wherever there's a record of God asking questions, The question is not for God's benefit. God already knows everything there is to know. God knows the answers. Whenever God asks a question, it is for the benefit of the hearer, the one who hears the question. When God asks the question, guys, have you caught anything? Have you had any fish? It was a teaching moment for those disciples. It was a moment where he was getting them to see the situation, the condition at which they were. 
You know, when, in the way back in the book of Genesis, when God asks in Genesis chapter 3, you know, Adam, where are you? It's not that God didn't know where Adam was. He knew exactly where Adam was. You know, it's, there's nothing that God does not know. And yet God asked that question. Why is it that he asked that question? It's because he wanted Adam to realize what he had done. Adam responds and he says, I'm trying to hide from you because I've sinned against you. It's when he asked the question, Adam realizes, wait a minute, I messed up. I, I'm hiding because I've sinned against God. You know, when, when God looks at Abraham and Sarah and asks them, you know, is there anything too hard for the Lord? He, he knows there's nothing too hard for him. But yet he asks the question. It's because he wants them to say, no, Lord, there's nothing too hard for you. You know, he, he confronts Sarah who laughed and chuckled, you know, it's not going to happen. God calls her by name and says, hey, didn't I hear you laugh? Didn't I hear you chuckle about it? And then they had to confess, say, no, Lord, there's nothing too difficult for you. And it's this moment, the same kind of scenario. Jesus stands by the seashore and asks this question to the guys, friends, have you had any fish? The moment they hear that question, they stop and they think and like, no, we don't. It's a moment of frustration. It's a moment of after doing things your way, has it worked out? After deciding to go on your own, have you had success? That's what Jesus was asking them. Guys, now that you thought, oh, my way was better than the way that Jesus gave me, have you found any sort of success in the way that you pursued? I almost sense the frustration with which probably they answered Jesus. A tinge of bitterness or anger, I do not know. It's more, more of a shouting back that she says, no, we haven't caught anything. You know, it's what they're screaming out to Jesus. I love Jesus' response. We have such a wonderful Savior. You know that? We have a loving, sweet, compassionate Savior who loves to continue to work in our lives as long as we allow Him to do that. There's so many people, we have this wrong picture of God, maybe because of our different religious upbringing, that God is somehow always displeased with us. God is somehow always looking to punish us. God is somehow always waiting for us to mess up so He can bring a stick and then beat us and tell us how horrible we are. That's not how God does. He loves to restore. He loves to help us to grow in who we are and become more like Him. And Jesus, as He stood by the shore, watching His own disciples, who He had called name by name, had prayed about each one of them before He called them, finding them back in their old profession, Jesus could have lost it. And yet He says, guys, have you got anything? Friends, do you know that Jesus has control over the fish? Just imagine with me what would have happened that night. Yeah, here's these macho fishermen all getting into their boats, seven of them, you know, they probably had to use, you know, some sort of lights because fishing during the night also was very popular in those days because fish is somehow attracted to light. So what they would do is probably hang a lantern on the side of their boat so that the fish seeing the light come towards the light. And as they come towards the light, they catch the fish. So they've had this lantern hanging by the side of the boat all night, you know, I don't know whose job it was to keep it burning. You know, they all probably took turns. They're keeping on lighting it again and again and again. And the whole night, there were 153 fish that was on the other side of the boat waiting. They did not come towards the light. Those 153 fish did what was against their instinct all night long because everything within them was saying, we got to go towards the light, go towards the light, go towards the light. But Jesus said, no, fish, I'm holding you until they learn something important. Here's something for us. Sometimes promises over our life are withheld until we learn what God is teaching us. There are some blessings and breakthroughs you're never going to get until you stop and say, Jesus, Tell me what is going wrong. What am I doing that you need, you, you need me to pay attention to? Because for the whole night, 153 fish were on the other side. I like how it was on the right side of the boat. Yeah, 
I don't know if God has a way of doing puns as well. It was not on the left side of the boat. It was on the right side of the boat. So when you are on the right side of God's plan and purpose, everything will work out for you. But when you're on the wrong side of it, even though you have the skill for it, it's not going to work out for you. Here are these disciples all night long. Frustration. Nothing works out for them. And Jesus comes by the shore and says, have you caught anything? No, we've not caught anything. Jesus says, guys, put your net on the other side of, I mean, the right side of the boat. So they put out the net on the right side of the boat. All these 153 fish waiting to be caught all night. Say, finally, you guys, you're doing the right thing. They all are caught in that moment. And I wonder, it was in those moments that John, the beloved disciple, has a deja vu. He says, wait a minute. We've had this exact same scenario happen to us once before. Where we were out all night, we caught nothing, and someone yelled out from the shore, have you guys got anything? Put your net on the other side, and we caught tons of fish. It's happening again. It's almost like Jesus repeated that miracle for the disciples to remind them of their call. Guys, remember how I called you. Remember I, how I brought you out of being fishers of fish to becoming fisher of men. It was in that moment, John, the beloved disciple, he realizes this is Jesus. This is the Lord who is doing this. And as he yells out, Thank God for Peter. Peter had that moment where he had to make a decision. Do I stay with this greatest catch that we've ever had? 153 fish that we will have bragging rights for the rest of our life to tell everyone about what we did, or do I get off the boat and go to him? What does Peter do? He leaves the blessing and goes to the one who gave it. Jumps over swims across to Jesus. And this is one miracle sometimes we, we may miss that happened that morning as well. The Bible says when all these disciples, when they reached back, awaiting them was breakfast. There was hot coal of fire, there was fish, and there was bread. Do you know Jesus was a chef? How many of you would like to eat breakfast made by Jesus? Yeah, that's what those guys did. Because this would have happened, or I don't know, he could have zapped his fingers and all of that could have happened as well. But in any case, the moment they decided to come back to him, provision began to happen. Without them even taking any effort, here they were toiling all night, no fish. But the moment they hear Jesus come to him, breakfast ready, food ready, provision ready. This is the truth that you will see in your life as you obey God church, anytime you listen to him and begin to obey him and walk towards his voice, provision always follows you. You don't have to search for provision. Job will follow you. You don't have to follow that job. That business opportunity will come to you. You don't have to go searching for it. For anyone who pursues the voice of Jesus Christ, to them is given all the provision that they need blessings that they need. That's what happened that morning. Those guys, all night long, nothing happened. But the moment Jesus spoke, instantly provision in their nets, provision when they got back to the shore, it was Jesus taking care of them in miraculous ways. And God can do the same in your life as well. When you give your life and say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow your voice. I'm going to give up what makes sense to me and still do the irrational thing. I tell you, in miraculous ways, God will open doors for you that you never thought existed. God will provide for you. God will bring the right person that will help build your business. In great ways, God will do amazing things when you follow his voice. What does Jesus do to these deserters? He ministers to them. He ministers to them. You know, I think the best way to, to reignite our faith is to remember what God has already done in our life. It's one of the best ways to, to ignite faith in us. The devil does not want you to remember your blessings. He wants you to remember 
your mess ups. But God says, forget that because I've taken care of it. Remember what I have done for you. It was in that moment when John and Peter and all the other five guys were in the boat and they realized that what Jesus had done for them before, it sparked something inside of Peter that, that morning. This is Jesus. When they remembered the first miracle, they positioned themselves for what God was about to do in their life as well. Any moments where you're dealing with a crisis of faith, where the devil is speaking lies to you and telling you how it's not going to work out, you're never going to have a child, you're never going to get married, your business is never going to have a breakthrough, you're never going to have money, you're never going to be blessed, you're never going to build a house. When the devil begins to lie to you on the, all the things that will never happen in your life because you're following Jesus, as a child of God, the most powerful thing you can do is stop for a moment and look back and think about every single promise that God has already fulfilled in your life. When you begin to remember the good things that God has done, faith begins to rise up in you. That's why we sing that song. What's that song? Count your blessings, name them one by one. And what does it do? It will surprise you what the Lord has done. When you begin to stop and think about all the ways that God has helped you, then you begin to realize if God has done those things, He can do greater things in my future as well. And it's something I've learned in my own walk with Jesus. Moments when I'm praying for something and I don't seem to have the answer for it, I look up my prayer journal and look through those times when I prayed for things and God answered those things. I said, God, you did this for me. You did that for me. And you even did this when I didn't even ask for it. So if you're a God who can answer my prayers and then even do things beyond what I even expect, you're able to take care of this situation. You're able to give me a breakthrough at this moment. You're able to change my situation and change my circumstance. I get up and I start speaking to my situation. I say, in the name of Jesus Christ, my miracle working God will make a way where there is no way. I don't care what the doctor said. I don't care what they said. I don't care what they said will not happen. When Jesus is with me, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I will have victory. God will change my situation. And when you begin to preach to yourself, you'll find yourself encouraged. It's when they sat in that boat and remembered what Jesus had done for them. The way he called them out of their, their livelihood and said, I'm calling you by name. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. It was in that moment when they were experiencing, when they remembered, is when they had the breakthrough. It says, man, this is Jesus. This is Jesus who's calling us. I tell you, church, we got to remember the things that God has done for us. There's so many amazing things that we forget so quickly. And that's what's the biggest problem with the children of Israel. They had this forgetfulness. God would lead them in miraculous ways, and they were always focused on the problems that they were facing. They never stopped to think about what God had already done in giving them victory over their past. And the moment we begin to look back and think, on the ways that God has blessed us and, and given us answers, it charges our faith. It strengthens us. And God begins to do amazing things in our lives as well. When you make the decision to follow the leading of God, the voice of God, He takes care of everything. I'll say it again because I had a resounding two amens for that one. I'll try it once more time. When you hear the voice of Jesus, and when you obey, and when you walk following His voice, He will take care of everything. Amen. You know, in that passage there, John chapter 21, there's one more passage I want to read, and I'll finish with that. The second part, you know, and uh, it's what happened after they got on the shore. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, he said to him, feed my lamb. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. A third time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? 
Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time. I don't know why he got grieved because he's done way more than Jesus at this point in time. But Peter again says to Jesus, he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, this passage in and of itself is a whole message we can deal on. I mean, look into the restoration of Peter and how tenderly Jesus brings Peter back to his call, to his purpose. But Jesus begins by asking him the question, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He says, what are these? You know, picture with me that morning. They're sitting there by the beach and the boat still tied you know, to the side of the shore, breakfast, having having been eaten it, Jesus looks at him, probably pointing towards the 153 fish on the floor or the boat that was tied up and says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your fishing? Do you love me more than your livelihood? Do you love me more than what you do for yourself, for your life? There's those moments that Peter, you know, has this clarity and realizes, yes, Jesus, I love you more than everything else in my life. And in those moments when Jesus asks him those three questions in three different ways, Jesus begins to help Peter receive confidence, receive that assurance, you know, of, of knowing that Jesus still loved him. Jesus still wanted him to do his plan, his purpose, because Jesus reminds him of what was about to happen. If you read the last few scriptures of that chapter as well, the way Jesus dealt with his disciples, who threw in the towel, shows us how merciful Jesus is. He did not berate them. He did not rebuke them for running away. He gently ministers to them with great love, restores all of them back to the call. And this encounter was so impactful in the life of Peter that the man who denied Jesus three times, and who went back fishing, would end up laying his life down for Jesus in his future, literally dying the most cruel death as well, just like his Savior, Peter would lay his life down. That moment by the beach that morning was so powerful in in Peter's life, the way Jesus restored him back to his call. I'm asking you, my friend, have you had a crisis of faith in your life. Maybe those who are watching us, you know, if you had a moment where you felt like giving up everything, going back to your old life, I want to tell you, let this chapter be a powerful lesson for us and how much Jesus loves us, how much he loves to restore us. Even when you step out of the will of God, he comes with such love and such grace and gently sets us back again on the right path. The devil whispers and says, well, you're never going to be good enough for him. You're never going to be good enough to be a Christian. And that's true by ourselves in and of ourselves. We will never be good enough. We'll never be righteous enough. And that's the greatest news of Christianity. It's not our work. It's the work of Jesus Christ on the cross that sanctifies us, that makes us righteous, that makes us adopted as sons and daughters. That's some truth you have to remind yourself. It's not because of who I am. It's not because of what I do. It's because of Jesus and what he did for me on the cross 2,000 years ago when he paid my ransom in full with his precious blood. He bought my freedom. And when Jesus buys a freedom for anyone, that freedom is for eternity. It's not for temporary. It's not for a certain season. All of us have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We have been sanctified, made right in the eyes of God. And today, when you stand before the Heavenly Father, even though in and of ourselves we have nothing to stake our claim towards, but because we have Jesus Christ and because our faith is on Jesus Christ, we stand before our Heavenly Father absolutely righteous, absolutely justified and sanctified, and we become sons and daughters of a living God. John chapter 21 is a wonderful example for us to follow and look into when we go through moments when we're about ready to give up and we look and say, Well, if you give up and you go back to what you knew before, it's not going to work out. That's for sure. 
The fish that were supposed to fall into your net will be on the other side of the boat all night long, all your life if need be. You know, it's not going to happen because God wants his children to walk according to his plans and his purposes. And if you allow it, if you come to him, if you surrender to him, he's able to restore his purpose over your life as well. This morning, I'm encouraging you. Maybe you're one of those, you know, persons who've lately allowed yourself to deviate from walking your faith with passion. Maybe you've allowed yourself to, to be bombarded by the many questions of the enemy over your faith, and you're starting to believe in some of the lies. This morning, I'm standing in front of you and say, don't listen to that voice. The God who called you is faithful. He will finish what he started in your life. He will perfect the things for which he has called you in this life as well. If you would come back to him, if you would allow him, God will restore everything back to you. You will have the full assurance of salvation, the full assurance of the call of God once again in your life. 